the public, media, and policymakers have uh, been very misinformed about the state of broadband and internet in urban communities. Uh, despite the notion that all is well digitally, there's still a lot of work that needs being done to deploy uh, these technologies in these communities. Currently, there are over 15 million homes in the U.S. that have no internet, and 75% of them uh, are communities of African Americans or other people of color. There's no broadband, and when there is no broadband, there's no uh, telehealth. Now, in the broadband world, um, libraries have become the the the, the, the uh, vanguard for broadband deployment. In fact, in some communities, the only source of broadband they have are uh, libraries. And so libraries are very important to broadband deployment. And our belief is that uh, the libraries will continue their importance in um, the deployment of telehealth. Now, our panelists today uh, are Shante Burns Simpson, who is the president of the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. Um, she believes that if you want to uh, plan to use technology to eliminate people's pain, you have to start by talking to those folks who have the pain. Catherine Trujillo is a deputy director for Libraries Without Borders, an organization that specializes in packaging uh, library content, services, and technology to deliver these resources into uh, underserved communities. Uh, one of their more successful uh, projects has been to bring library services and telehealth into laundromats. Simply amazing. And then uh, Renee Patton is the, uh, the um, Global Education and Healthcare Director at Cisco Systems. One of her roles is to provide um, technologies that help bridge the digital divide and also to keep organizations such as libraries stay on the leading edge of technology. So I want to kick this off with a question to um, Shante. You know, right now, we're going through a transition as libraries are starting to um, open up more. But the question is, you know, can you see how libraries can um, have an impact on the health care in low-income communities in particular? Oh, absolutely, Craig. We can definitely um, continue to fill the digital divide for communities who do not have uh, Wi-Fi access from home or may not have a computer or, or a laptop or um, stable internet service from their phone. So the libraries at this point time, like you said, we're, we're in this process of trying to figure out how to, to have service with um, the pandemic still happening. So to think about how we're going to continue to engage and offer services to our communities, um, telehealth service being uh, one of those services that we would like to, to promote moving forward. Uh, I know it will be different and will look different depending on the libraries and where they're located um, because we know that space is very, very important. Libraries have become a community center uh, for many communities across the country. So being able to make sure that we have space for people to be able to engage with their doctors, but without having to have the whole library hear their information 
it is what's uh, one thing that we would really need to consider because some libraries will have um, a space where a small closed room with uh, a computer for a, a patron to talk to the doctors. Some libraries might have one programming space. And so trying to fit in uh, having people sign up or schedule uh, being able to speak to the doctors in between a story time or a book discussion. It's just, this is the beginning of a conversation, but definitely important conversation to have. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. I'm going to actually ask Catherine, you know, sort of to expound on that. Um, uh, there's been some really interesting stuff that I've read about um, libraries without uh, borders, how do you see libraries having an impact in the healthcare in um, low income communities? Um, thank you, Craig, for that question. So uh, I think that libraries are uniquely positioned to uh, at least uh, provide communities especially low-income communities, with reliable um, information, right? So I think that's one of the <laughs> that's one of the buzzwords right now. There's misinformation, and uh, the libraries have always been at the forefront of ensuring that they provide folks with uh, information that's relevant and reliable. Um, so by working with our library partners, um, in particular in places like Detroit, in Oakland, um, in Puerto Rico, we've been able to provide reliable health information um, that uh, when partnered with a public health organization or some other community-based organization um, is uh, provides a much more holistic uh, support uh, for community members. Um, and that's been really effective in helping to uh, ensure that the quality of information is um, high and that it's also um, linked to direct service. The direct service component is, is also key. Mm -hmm. So Renee, you're looking at things from obviously a different perspective and from the healthcare provider and so forth. Um, what's your take on the potential role of the libraries um, being able to affect um, telehealth? Yeah, Craig, it's a great question. And I would just um, reiterate what, what Kat and Shanti said. Absolutely. That's kind of the magic formula, what they laid out in terms of it being able to deliver quality information, being able to provide spaces for these libraries. So I think um, one of the most important things from a telehealth perspective is absolutely for them to have those flexible spaces for video consults with their uh, with their doctors, with other healthcare providers. So I think that's one of the most important things, making sure that they have you know very high quality video um, delivery systems and having all of the core infrastructure to be able to offer those services. I think the other thing that is interesting and important about this conversation is that libraries are a part of the federal E-rate program. Mm -hmm. And so they are able to apply for um, federal funding for connectivity services to help bridge the digital divide. So I think not only can they be of service to the educational community, but certainly to the broader community for services like telehealth um, visits and, and patient care. I think the other part of this too is making sure that there's integration between the existing provider, electronic health records, electronic medical records systems, between that and the video and the learning spaces or actually the health consult spaces within the library. Mm -hmm. So now what would you give as advice to libraries in terms of how can they um, get the best results and the best bang for their dollars um, from the uh, from the healthcare partnerships that they're looking to um, forge? I think uh, the first thing is to have a plan. So I think being able to say, here's our vision for uh, delivering care uh, virtually, and, and that really is kind of the basis for any of the federal funding programs that they might um, identify and, and apply for. So whether it's E-rate or mm -hmm. any of the other grant or stimulus programs, I think what's really important is, is to say, this is my vision for delivering care. This is what it looks like physically across the library. 
and looking again, not only the technology is almost the easy part, but it's making sure <laughs> that you're working with a great, you know, technology partner to say, this is specifically what you need. You need the underlying core infrastructure. You have to make sure that you have not only the right security technologies, but the right security policies. You have to be thinking about patient privacy and, and patient data privacy and security. And then certainly the quality of the video delivery and making sure that that's integrated into the existing uh, healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. uh, Shante, from you know your perspective, um, is this an easy uh, accomplishment to, to pull together, um, forming the right types of partnerships with healthcare partners? Uh, I guess what are the one or two main things that you would advise your colleagues uh, to do to ensure that that partnership works to maximum effectiveness? So the public libraries, I, I, we are uh, great at forming partnerships with outside organizations. Uh, like Catherine pointed out, libraries is one of the most trusted organizations when you go and ask uh, the patrons, we are mm -hmm. really up there, probably at the places of worship, honestly. People come to the library and they do trust the information that they get from their public librarian. Now, before the pandemic, we, I think, I believe many libraries felt like they were really doing a great job of filling the digital divide. But then when um, the pandemic happened and we had remote learning, and some libraries, uh, including uh, New York Public Library, we were handing out hotspots. And you mm -hmm. could connect up to four to eight devices to one hotspot. It was like, okay, so you, you check out a hotspot, you get to check it out for six months, you could renew it for another six months. So you have a year of having Wi-Fi in your home. Uh, but with uh, remote learning, people working from home and needing all this access, that was not enough. And then when we're talking about the different um, types of technology, uh, we all know some are better than others. And the types of technology that many uh, libraries were buying were like uh, Chromebooks, like really basic technology where we were above basics at this point. And so I really want to uh, have folks think, especially when we are looking at heavily dependent on uh, Wi-Fi and technology. At this point, uh, BCALA, the Black Caucus of the American Library Association, we are really supporting the American Library Association and really saying having Wi-Fi as being a basic need for all uh, Americans to have, because at this point we know that, that we would not be able to, to get anywhere without being able to have some kind of access to be able to, to uh, connect with each other. So with mm -hmm. us still continuing to have these conversations, we really just need to make sure that uh, we are fighting to make sure that this is something that all households can have access to, that all places across the country uh, have the, the digital wiring because it, it, it's not, that's not what's happening right now. So even in your rural areas uh, where there's not a, a library that you can walk to very easily, like in um, your inner cities, it's still uh, more than just being able to say we have a laptop and, and Wi-Fi. It's more about being able to make sure that the community is set up to have access. So mm -hmm. the, these are the hard and heavy conversations that we're having at this point. Um, to support the work that we know uh, is not going to go away. Remote learning, remote work, none of this is going away. And this mm -hmm. telehealth is just just really a, another important step for us to say this is what we need moving mm -hmm. forward. Great. Now, um, I just wrote a guide for libraries that want to use telehealth. And uh, one of the things that caught my attention was... Um, oh, good lordy. Uh, border, uh, uh, front, mm, libraries without borders, right? That really got my, you know, juices flowing. Kath, Catherine, explain the basics behind um, uh, this, this whole laundromat uh, project? Um, I would love to. So um, 
The laundromat project uh, that Craig's referring to is called the Wash and Learn Initiative, uh, affectionately known as WALL-E. Um, and it's essentially uh, an, a program that uh, sets up libraries and learning spaces inside laundromats. Um, and it sounds kind of simple, but it's, uh, in, it's incredibly effective uh, because, you know, when you're at the laundromat, you hit a number of populations that tend to be low income um, in under-resourced communities. Um, oftentimes, they're young children with parents um, or with guardians. Uh, but, you know, obviously, the demographics really uh, change according to the community. Um, but you're there for, on average, two and a half hours. Um, and especially if you're a parent with a young child. Um, <laughs> I know that when I was a kid, um, I wish my, my parents probably wish that they had Wally because <laughs> I was like, <laughs> running around, jumping in the laundromat carts. Um, so this is actually kind of a, a, a program that capitalizes on that sweet spot. Mm -hmm. um, and by working, again, uh, with libraries uh, and other community-based organizations, uh, we've been able to bring not only um, reliable information into the laundromat, but oftentimes other critical services. Um, so, for instance, uh, during COVID, rental assistance, um, connecting folks to food pantries, um, legal legal aid. Uh, so, again, we're not, you know, experts in any one of those fields. What we're experts at is creative placemaking and really um, and creative partnerships. So being able to transform a space um, and make it very warm and welcoming in addition to functional. Um, so that's that's a little bit about Wally and how uh, we try to capitalize on the laundromat environment uh, in order mm -hmm. to meet the needs of underserved communities across the country. Okay. So um, I want to come back to the issue of how libraries can make the best of their um, partnerships with healthcare professionals. Um, Renee, do you have a, the, an additional thoughts on uh, this, especially when you have to deal with the issue of uh, the broadband connection? I have seen money being distributed to healthcare providers to ultimately, um, you know, work with the, the, the community. But um, what they don't uh, plan out, or I should say a year ago, this was a problem, right? Which was um, no one took into account that uh, people didn't have good broadband. So where you would have money and you would have uh, the healthcare expertise. Uh, Renee, what do we do about the, um, the, 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 the infrastructure part of it? Yeah, it's, a, it's another great question, Craig. I think that's where it comes back to, and there was a comment made earlier about bringing the community together. And so I think it really is community specific and it's being able to identify who are the key stakeholders in the community. So as you're thinking about the community, certainly it's the, it's the mayor, it's the town council. So it's the government body, it's the healthcare providers and organizations within the community. Um, it's certainly the school district, the school leaders, and then of course the libraries. And so I think being able to pull those key stakeholders together initially and really understand what are they trying to accomplish? So this comes back to the strategic plan. How many students are there? How many individuals need you know, education? How many of them need care? Whatever other services that can be offered. So really kind of mapping out what is it that we'd like to define for our community and what does that look like? And then who are the partners who we need to bring in? So groups like you know, Cat's group, Shanti's, Shanti's groups, um, professional associations, and even community members so that they can have a voice, they have a seat at the table, and they can say, these are the challenges I have, and this is where I'm having a problem with access. And so I think understanding not only getting the stakeholders together, but getting the community members together to figure out what are the problems we're trying to solve, what are the gaps we have, and then how do we solve this together, and then who are some of the technology partners who we can bring in as well because many of these technology partners drive big transformational change and they're able to have a seat at the table with those leaders to help build the definition of the plan, identify the gaps, and then figure out how to implement a solution for the community. That, that would be my best guidance. I don't know if that answers your question, Craig. But no, that's, no that, that, that's what I was looking for, you know, because there's a lot of 
moving parts. And in mm -hmm. fact, um, Shante, one of my questions, um, you know, are the libraries the folks that can bring the different parts of the community? I mean, you talked about churches, right? But there's also there's barbershops. There are uh, fast food places, though we probably don't want to talk about that in the context of healthcare sometimes. Mm -hmm. But there are various um, entities that may not be on the radar of the folks in, in Washington and the state house and so forth. But, but, but Shante, can we expect or hope that the, uh, the libraries can play a big hand in bringing these communities together? Yes. So at this time, many libraries have outreach services. Mm -hmm. So we have um, staff that are going out to the communities, letting the community know about all the resources and the programs, things that they might not know we have. Because I know everybody says, okay, it's a library, they have books. And they're not thinking of anything else. You know how many times we will go out into schools to let them know that we're checking out hotspots and they'd be so shocked. So outreach services is about us going out into schools, barbershops, just out into the community, letting them know what the library has to offer. Because we know that we have to go outside our four walls to let the community know what the library has and to get them into the building. And then we also, many libraries have uh, mobile libraries. So they're driving yeah. out into the community, being able to offer uh, broadband and all of these um, services and activities out into community-based organizations and everywhere else. So it's about us doing more outreach to let them know what they is bring what the library will to offer and also learn from the community to see see the public. Mm -hmm. So now um, uh, we can't assume that we know. Sorry, sorry. Okay, um, let's talk about um, a little bit. Catherine, your organization is actually an international organization. And I read when I was doing my research, a lot of interesting stories. And I'd just like to get an idea from you. Um, what are one or two of those international uh, solutions that might be able to be used in the U.S.? Um, yes, thank you, Craig. Uh, it's true, Libraries Without Borders is the U.S. branch of Bibliothèque Sans Frontières, which is an international um, organization uh, focused on uh, providing access to information, particularly during humanitarian emergencies, but also disaster context um, or you know post-conflict uh, societies. So. Uh, two of the projects that I'm particularly um, fond of because I, I think they're kind of like Wally, they're very brilliant. And uh, I, the approach just, you know, literally meets people where they are. Um, the mm -hmm. first is our, uh, a program in Colombia uh, that we, uh, uh, we launched in partnership with the National Library and the Ministry of Culture. And that one uh, used our uh, pop-up library tool called the Ideas Box um, mm -hmm. and uh, had 27 of these different pop-up libraries uh, go into the demobilization zones. Um, so, you know, after the 50 year civil war in Colombia, uh, the uh, government wasn't in, in some of the areas that had been controlled by um, the FARC, um, you know, th there was a lot of distrust and there hadn't been government services in some of these areas for <laughs> nearly 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, so the libraries, the pop-up libraries, the ideas boxes, they became a space for uh, for for reconciliation and also, um, you know, a, a place for folks uh, within a community to come together, um, but also with other communities. And really this, we found that after two years had uh, incredible uh, effects in terms of promoting uh, psychosocial well-being for children and for adults. Um, so really the libraries, the pop-up libraries were a neutral space 
um, mm -hmm. or were seen as a neutral space rather, um, but they played this this pivotal role in promoting um, post-conflict reconciliation um, and overall well-being. And um, in Bangladesh, uh, we have a similar program, albeit um, it's uh, focused on serving the needs of Rohingya refugees, um, but we're still using the same pop-up library, the Ideas Box. And uh, that program is, is um, really interesting because we have a number of limitations that have been placed on us by <laughs> by the government of Bangladesh. Um, mm -hmm. Namely, you know, we can't provide certain types of education or information to women and girls, which is very frustrating. Um, so one of the ways that we try to get around it while still, you know, not getting kicked out of the country um, mm -hmm. uh, is by uh, providing health literacy and health information through things like yoga um, and using that uh, to help uh, tackle uh, issues of stress um, and trauma also. But, you know, again, we're uh, under the guise of yoga <laughs> and trying to get people <laughs> to learn, um, you know, mindfulness um, in addition to providing uh, mothers primarily with um, health information on, you know, how to care for their children and trying to do as much as we can with, you know, within the constraints um, that we've been placed under by the government um, and it providing folks with access to information in, um, you know, whatever way we can. Uh, so those are two of the big projects that I'm, you know, very excited about and think do an excellent job of meeting people where they are. Excellent, excellent. Um, uh, Renee, I have a question about um, the issue of, we have libraries and then we have um, schools and they are distinct focuses for like the federal government in terms of how they distribute money and so forth. But as we start to talk about telehealth and we start talking about, you know, a different uh, set of circumstances because it's now post uh, supposedly uh, post pandemic. What is the role of the schools if we're saying we want to get the best from the libraries? Does that necessitate or is it make, you know, definitely necessary to, um, to bring the schools into that telehealth picture? Well, I think one of the areas where there's the clearest connection, Craig, is with um, student health services and student mm -hmm. health and well-being. So I think it's just another, the schools like the libraries can be another access point for telehealth. So I think that's the connection. The overriding issue continues, continues to be the cost of, of broadband connectivity and access. So that's a problem that we have to solve for our rural communities across the country. And, uh, and under advantage um, areas. And so I think one of the things that we've done is we've just made a $20 million strategic investment in a new um, rural broadband innovation center in North Carolina to mm -hmm. help drive some of the technology innovations that will make it easier for our service provider customers to connect, automate, and secure um, these different um, foundational networking uh, technologies to more easily and cost-effectively offer up broadband access. So mm -hmm. I think that's the, I think that's still kind of a, we've got to get, we have to make it easier, more affordable for our service providers to offer those services. And then again, to your point, look at it holistically. How does it impact schools? How does it impact the library? How do we bring telehealth providers into the fold? I think the other thing that's happened with this pandemic is we never imagined, I mean, our telehealth adoption, as you know, was so low prior to the pandemic. And that, so it was remote learning. So now these are just things that we have an automatic expectation that we'll be able to get access to virtual learning, access to virtual care um, services to help us to be healthier and more effective. So I think because of the pandemic for as difficult and challenging as it's been, it's opened the opportunity up for all different kinds of organizations to provide um, care services and learning services. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that I, I just jump right in real quick. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, please, please. Because I have to completely agree with Renee. I mean, um, if you go to certain, um, especially in urban areas, if you go into their schools, it's like, um, Fort Knox to gain access to, uh -huh. to 
the Wi-Fi, your if you go into the building, your your phone is not going to work. Uh, and as teachers can tell you, it takes so long for them to be able to pull up a website on their smart board. So really, this is a huge discussion for both the libraries and schools in um, predominantly black and brown neighborhoods to really talk about um, not just Wi-Fi access, but being able to, uh, to really distinguish between good broadband uh, services and being able to, to provide it to, to our mm-hmm. communities. Mm-hmm. One of the things um, that I found when I was doing my library research was uh, there was some Um, a lot of focus on the needs assessment. Now, I, as a uh, broadband consultant and helping people with their um, telehealth uh, issues and so forth, um, I've been always fanatical about um, the needs assessment, right? So, again, from your perspective, what do you think about the importance of the needs assessment you know, the basically asking the people with the pain, how do we solve the problem? Um, and uh, what, what, what it might be some uh, best practices for um, ac- achieving good uh, needs assessment? I, I personally think it's at the heart of everything. Um, because if, if we can be very oh, yeah. specific and pointed about the problems we're trying to solve for whom, when, and where, then mm-hmm. we can better make the case because if there's no access and these, you know, people are suffering and we're not seeing the outcomes that we should be seeing for these communities, that helps to build the case mm-hmm. to make an investment. But it has to be really about, it has to be about the individual and the pain that they're suffering. Right. Uh, uh, Shante, I didn't mean to, to cut you off. Can you get your... Uh, you know, what's your your take on uh, best practices for needs assessment? Um, yeah, we we have to make sure that again, while we're out in those communities to make sure that we are um, asking their focused questions so that we're able to, when we're applying for this funding, p- applying for these grants, so any kind of, of money that the, that the library is asking for, being able to say that we are going to meet the needs of X, Y, and Z. I don't know that these are the needs and being able to say uh, confidence that this is what my community needs and wants. And again, being able to show in our numbers uh, based on the visits, based on uh, checkouts, whatever, we all know that. And that also means a lot to uh, your, your, like you said, government, your local officials, your bigger officials, because again, these are people who can vote. And so they want to be able to say, especially in an election year, like, okay, so this funding that we got from our local senator, invite them to one of these uh, computer classes or, or, or uh, to, your, to the ribbon cutting of a computer lab. You need to be able to make sure that when you are asking for these this um, the money, being able to show where it's going for it, being able to show community is coming in and using it so that you can get more. Mm-hmm. So let me ask, we're starting to run down uh, here with our, with our time, but I'd like to ask, starting with Catherine, uh, you know, what all of you think about this one question. If the libraries are focusing or if they start to increase their focus on telehealth, do you think that this will get more people uh, willing to fund libraries? And again, start with with uh, Catherine. Uh, Undoubtedly, yes. I think that Mm. um, by enabling uh, community members to access telehealth resources, either at the library or with support from the library or through library outreach, um, Mm -hmm. you know, that's going to be... um, 
such a, an incredible asset um, for a number of community members. Um, in, in Puerto Rico, where we have a project, um, we saw that exact same thing. So, you know, we were working um, with a number of community based organizations um, and the library system in the municipality where we were, uh, where we are, uh, you know, doesn't have a lot of funding. Um, but because we were able to secure um, a National Science Foundation grant, um, we uh, then um, were, uh, we set up three community centers as connectivity hubs. Um, so we, we um, provided, you know, laptops, tablets, um, and internet connectivity uh, in these three community centers, um, partnered with public health organizations that provided health information. And then the libraries also uh, got involved and because we had conducted such a robust um, community needs assessment, we had this baseline that show, that demonstrated, okay, this is what community members were struggling with before. And now that these connect, uh, connectivity hubs are in, um, in their neighborhoods, uh, we've already seen, you know, a number of um, improvements. And so the library can go back to the, um, to the mayor's office and say, you know, through this um, intervention, we're having X, Y, Z impact and make the case for either expanding their uh, funding for library outreach services or generally for the library system. So that's been something that we've um, found to be quite successful. Um, so even just providing a space for safe failure where libraries can, uh, you know, put one foot in, but not necessarily have to, um, you know, invest a number of, um, staff and, and certainly not money, um, but they can see whether or not an intervention is going to, you know, give them the impact that they want. Um, so we really try to set up projects that expand and amplify the reach of libraries. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Shante, what's your take on uh, this, this issue? Um, telehealth is a program that's going to cover all age ranges that come into your library. So from the little bitty babies, early literacy to your senior citizens, this is going to be a service that is going to support every walk of life that is in your community. So that, that is, and this is something that we, the public library wants to be able to support. So, okay. yeah, definitely gotcha. something that we're concentrating <laughs> okay. on. Excellent. Uh, Renee, what's your take? I, I agree 100%. And I think in so many of our communities, the libraries are the best kept secrets. And so I, th <laughs> <laughs> I think Excellent. Being able to make it you know, easier for them to offer even more services. And I love that whole, you know, the whole idea that Catherine and Shanti both um, highlighted that th these are places of, of information, trusted information. So, so when you think about expanding that to every walk of life, um, whether it's the local school system, the entire community, I think it's a great opportunity for our libraries really to um, take off and, and be less of a secret and to really help us to create better communities, better healthy okay. communities. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for a last question. Um, let's start with Shante. Um, there are some uh, library staff folks that are not fully committed to this idea of telehealth. I mean, we call, we'll call them fence center sitters. Um, what would you, um, you know, shortly, in a short period of time, how would you explain or how would you try to motivate those uh, uh, fence sitters to go on uh, moving forward with some sort of telehealth plan? Um, I know many uh, staff members are probably thinking, what does this mean to my everyday workload? Mm, and honestly, this would be a program that would be offered that it is pretty much, you don't have to do much. You just need to make sure you have the computer and the space available. So I think it's just more about staffing being able to uh, feel like they are going to offer more to the community without having to uh, 
try to figure out or juggle what else they have to add <laughs> yeah. to their workload. So mm-hmm. again, just being able to lay out what this program would look like. And again, it would just really pretty much be a space um, and Wi-Fi and, and probably a sign up, being able to schedule that. And that could be done electronically um, if your library supports that. But um, again, being able to also think about um, making sure that it is, we're not collecting any information. So if somebody signs up for this telehealth, it's not something that we're keeping track of. And so we can have signage. So that's another thing that staff mm-hmm. can be supported with saying that, no, you're, you're signing up to do this, but we're not collecting it. We're not uh, seeing how many times you're coming in to speak to your doctor. We're not uh keeping any of that information. So just being able to support staff, making sure that this is a program that we want to support, but it's not going to add to your workload is pretty much what I would say to to many staff members. Mm -hmm. Uh, Renee, what would you say to the fence centers? Uh, We we have the same, some of the very similar challenges in education as well. And also in healthcare with a faculty adoption Um, clinician administrator adoption of technology. So we have to make it so easy for them. And so I think that's the other thing. They just need to know this is the button to push. This is how I can help, you know, our our clients to get up and running. Um, So I think the ease of use and and the materials, the adoption materials to make it very simple for them to learn how to use the technology and then to make it easy for um, patrons who come into the library. Excellent. Excellent. Catherine. How would you talk to the the fence center sitters? Um, I I was smiling as Renee and Shante were speaking because uh, I kept thinking, yes, we are the organization that comes in and tries to have some kind of layout already of um, you know what a program or project will look like. Um, so by ensuring that we do a lot of the legwork, um, because we know that libraries in particular are. Um, librarians are overextended and um, you know it's very real in terms of uh, every time we have a conversation with a librarian their first thought they might be excited but their first thought is "Ooh, who's gonna you know how is this gonna work do we have the staff Um, and so trying to uh, really meet also the librarians where they are um, and not add to the workload um, uh, and just demonstrate you know this is how um, this program can expand your reach without, um, you know, ex- overextending your staff. Um, so I think that uh, that's one of our, our value as an organization. Um, in addition to working with community, community members themselves uh, to adopt uh, traditional content. So a lot of health literacy content isn't uh, necessarily directly relevant to um, a community, especially at a hyper-local level. So um, working with uh, trusted voices or community leaders to identify some of the topics and through our community needs assessment um, that make most sense for that community um, and making sure that it's in uh, language that um, folks speak and that it's available in uh, a number of um, levels uh, for folks who are, you know, incredibly proficient to uh, people who are not literate, um, just making sure that we can provide visuals um, in addition to the actual information. So th- those are some of the strategies that I'd use and that we use now. Okay. All right. Last question. What's your vision of what we can do with telehealth? The short maybe one minute on, uh, on how, you know, what's, what's your vision? What do you see with libraries and telehealth? And let's start with Shante. Uh, you know what? That is a million dollar question. Um, <laughs> and I would love to start with saying that every library would get a million dollars to start with to support this initiative. <laughs> that would be my, my dream. Um, but honestly, just being able to to continue to uh, be able to just have uh, technology, broadband. Um, again, I love uh, what Catherine pointed out, which is very true, being able to have uh, books and, and handouts in all languages at every reading level. Um, and then also just to continue to have um, our local um 
physicians, uh, people from the hospital to continue to come and do free programming within the library. Because again, we want to be able to uh, have um, the technology to have people speak to their to their doctors, but we also want to have ongoing programming to support health overall. Okay, great. Uh, Renee? Uh, I, think I think I might be frozen. I don't know. Can you hear me okay, Craig? It's a little, it's a little staticky. Okay. Um, I would say ubiquitous, high quality access points for virtual care. Okay, that that would be the the miss the the the, the vision. Yep. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, um, Catherine, your vision. My vision starts with broadband access and just ensuring equitable access to broadband. Uh, Shantae said it earlier, um, you know, internet connectivity and broadband really is, a, it should be regarded as like water, food and water. You need it to live and you need it for telehealth. So um, my vision would be focusing on the broadband piece because it's, it's absolutely essential. It lays the foundation for all of the other pieces that we've already talked about today. Excellent, excellent. Catherine and Renee and Shante, this has been an awesome discussion. And definitely you folks are the visionaries for whom uh, this, uh, this initiative will go far. And so I want to thank you for your time and your expertise. And uh, also thank you to the audience for stopping by and, you know, giving us a listen. Thank you very much again.